Hey everyone, today we are going to be talking about the long and sad story of the Albanorks because they have such a heartbreaking story, which is standard for the majority of characters in The Lands Between, but I found theirs to be exceptionally tragic. So this ended up being a much more in-depth topic than I first assumed it'd be when I was working on it. And it turns out there's just so much importance behind the Albanorics. So I'm hoping this will be informative and help piece together some of their background. We'll start with the village of the Albanorics, since that's probably where a lot of us would first find them. Immediately when you are riding up to the village, you're greeted with the most grisly scene. There's just death everywhere, bodies slaughtered. Any survivors that you find have just gone mad with grief. They're just muttering to themselves and terrified and you fight an omen killer here and that's who we can attribute all of this murder and slaughter to. And omen killers were, some of them were former perfumers that concocted these potions to rid themselves of emotions so that they could hunt and murder the omen without any kind of hesitation. You'll see Nefeli Lu at the entrance of the village and she is the adopted daughter of Gideon Ofnir, and she's just enraged by this slaughter and by all of the just hatred she sees. She tells you that she's witnessed the same thing that happened to her people as a child, and she vows to get justice for them. But sadly, we find out soon after this that it was actually Gideon himself who ordered the massacre of the village, and this revelation leads to a falling out between Nefeli and Gideon. Further in the village, you'll find a survivor named Albus, who has disguised himself to stay alive. And Albus will explain to you the sad fate of the Albanorics like him. As they grow older, they eventually lose function in their legs, and so they're only able to pull themselves around by their arms. And you can imagine in a world as dangerous as the lands between, this just leaves them completely helpless. Albus will give you half of a medallion that he says leads to a chosen land for the Albanorics, and he tells you to go bring this to a young Albanoric named Latena because she has a mission there that she has to finish. When we find Latena, she's mourning over the body of her wolf companion Lobo, who was also killed by Gideon as he was trying to elicit information about where this medallion was. And the wolves are so integral to the Albanoric archers because of their lack of mobility, so this is like the only way she was able to get around. Because she is no longer able to do that, she asks if she can continue the journey with us and if we can take her to the Halleck Tree, so she accompanies you as a spirit summons who will aid you in battle. To the north in the middle of Lake of Luernia is Academy Gate Town, and here we see the second generation of Albanorks, and they are very iconic, they have these heads that look like frogs, and these big pot bellies, and they travel around in these little gangs. They have their weapons that look like they're reminiscent of ripples and water. And not only are they upright and walking, they are very acrobatic and they can do all these amazing cartwheels. All the Albanorics, both the first and the second generations, will have a chance of dropping an Albanoric blood clot when you kill them. And it says that the Albanorks were made by human hands, and because of this, many believe them to be impure and untouched by the grace of the Erd Tree. And this is why they are so heavily discriminated against, because they aren't even seen as equal beings deserving of basic respect. Farther northeast in the Karia Manor, we meet another first generation Albanork called Padilla, and he introduces himself as a servant to the Karian royal family, and he's caretaker to these morbid puppets. And Padilla gives off very weird vibes, just the way he talks. It, he doesn't he doesn't sound trustworthy. And he seems to be harmless, but there may be something more sinister going on regarding his possible connections to Celavis, but that is that is a whole other issue because the puppet stuff is just that's its own thing. But sadly, when we see Padilla later on in the game, he's been murdered by said puppets, which makes me think that there may have been something going on for the puppets to retaliate like that. You just don't turn against your master for no reason. So I think Padilla was up to no good. But nonetheless, Padilla serves as a connection between the Karian royal family and the Albanorics in some way. 
And this might fit into line with how the Karians treated others. We see them as having accepted trolls, as Karian knights, they fought alongside Queen Renala as her comrades, as her equals. And we've seen Raya Lucaria attempt to foster peace with the demi-humans by teaching them sorcery and giving them glintstone staffs. So the presence of the second generation Albanorks in this Lake of Luarnia area near Raya Lucaria just might be here to further, further illustrate the more open-minded attitude of the Karian family regarding those in service to them and maybe even have given them like a place of refuge or given them employments. But this brings me to my first point of confusion because of the possible ties to the Karian family. This shield is dropped by those second generation Albanorks in Academy Gate Town and it says that the Albanorks most formidable foes were sorcerers and that the shield blocks magic damage because of this. At first, I thought this might have been a hint about the history between the Albanorics and the Academy because the Academy is so heavily associated with sorcery, but this Albanoric staff says that it was wielded by the Albanorics of old, which are those first generation Albanorics, and that they harbor a secret and that they cast their sorcery through their innate arcaneness and arcane means secretive and mysterious. But this is the same staff that Padilla uses, uses, along with the other Albanoric sorcerers that you can see. So it's interesting that the second generation of Albanorics carry the shield that says sorcerers were their biggest enemy, and that the first generation Albanorics had this staff that says they're carrying a secret. So what does this mean? I'm not really confident, I'm just sharing it with you because clearly this means something. But I'm thinking that either there was some infighting between the first and second generation, or there, there is some bad history with the Albanorics and the Academy, and they came from a, a background of persecution of the sorcerers in the past. I just don't, I don't think there's enough here to say anything definitively. Continuing north from Luernia, we see more cruelty against the Albanorics in Volcano Manor. And we see them just being tortured in the most horrendous of ways, being pinned in these awful devices that suspend them in the air and they're unable to move or defend themselves. It seems like they're being used as security alarms. They will scream out in fear when you approach them. Just, It's just so terrible. And, and many of them have been subject to wearing these terrible torture devices these black hoods on them that magnify pain and magnify fear and I just this was I hated Volcano Manor the torture imagery was just so much and I'm extremely sensitive kind of like made me sick it was it was just oh it was way too much but this I felt like this this hood was one of the worst things just because it was so insanely over-the-top cruel. Rikard used blood sacrifices for the serpent, so we know that the Albanorks aren't being used as sacrifices because they're just a man-made creation. It just seems like they're here to be tortured because of how they were viewed as a persecuted class, as, as not having grace. And it just, to me, just shows how impossibly evil Rikard was. We see this same exact style of torture against the Albanorks that is happening in Castle Soul up in the um, mountaintops of the giants and because this is so heavily associated with Rikard, I'm wondering why this room is here in the castle because Castle Soul is where you come to find the second part of the secret Halleck tree medallion so if this is a torture room is it here to just signify to us that Rikard was here at some point that maybe he was on a campaign to find out how to reach the Halig tree and thus defeat Mikla and Melania. I think that would make sense because it would be fitting with his motives to, to devour the gods. But I don't think that Commander Nile, who's in charge of Castle Soul, I don't think this is him because he was given that second half of the medallion as a gift so that he could visit the Halig tree whenever he wanted. And his grandson, Commander O'Neill, who you fight in Caled, he's part of Melania's army in the Battle of Aeonia. So they're on Mikola's side, they're on Melania's side. So it doesn't make sense that Commander Niall would be 
persecuting Albinorix, torturing them here. So as a visual reference to Rikard, because it so heavily links to Volcano Manor, I personally think this is here as a sort of calling card as to tell you like, Rikard was in this area at some point. I don't know when, but he was here. Because otherwise, I don't, I don't have a better explanation for why the Albinorix are being tortured at Castle Soul. But now that we have the full medallion in our possession, we reach the consecrated snowfields, and we are that much closer to bringing Latena to the end of her journey. Ordina liturgical town is to the far north, and by now it's a ghost town. It's filled with the spirits of Albinorix and their wolves, and it's heavily guarded with non-ghost Albinoric archers who have amazing range and are just so incredibly annoying. In order to reach the Halleck tree, you have to light four of the torches in the Everjail and you have to fight off Black Knife assassins and Albinoric archers in there while you do so. And I think it's interesting how all of the archers and assassins in this area here are women. And I'm positive there's a connection, but I just don't know what it can be because you can even find a full set of Black Knife assassin armor in this town. So. I feel like it's an important connection between the Albinorix and the Black Knife Assassins, but I just don't know what that connection is yet. But after you light those four pesky torches, you finally reach the Halig Tree, which makes Ordina Liturgical Town an extremely significant location. Liturgy means public worship, so the town was probably built not only as an entrance to the Halleck Tree, you see this grand staircase leading up to the portal, but also as a revered site of worship to it. The presence of Albinorix here illustrates how important that the Halleck Tree was to them. Albus referred to it as a chosen land. This is where they all wanted to go. A little to the northeast, you will find the apostate derelict, and this is an abandoned church with a name that is quite revealing. I think the name says a lot. So apostate means someone who has abandoned their beliefs and derelict is something that has been abandoned through neglect. It can also mean someone without a home. So without the with these two definitions together, someone who's a who has abandoned their beliefs and someone without a home, I think that's quite significant. But inside we find a giant sleeping albinoric woman and she is identical in appearance to Latena and the other archers give or take 15 feet. Latena calls her sister and gives her a birthing droplet with the instruction to create life for all the Albinorix and that with this, her purpose is finally fulfilled now that she has hope for the future. Keeping with the very strong rebirth theme in the game, I think this means that she will birth anew the Albinorix not as a man-made creation, but as beings created from life. They will have an originator, they'll have a figure that they came from. And next to her sleeping giantess, we find this silver mirror shield that once belonged to Loretta, Knight of the Halleck Tree. And we, of course, have met Loretta before as a projection when she was the Carian Royal Knight Loretta at the Carian Manor. The second time we run into her, she is Loretta, Knight of the Halleck Tree. And she's not a projection anymore, she's the real flesh and blood person just with that title change. When you defeat her, she drops an archery sorcery that says that she developed it after her long bloody journey to seek out a place where the Albinorix could live in peace. And both of her sorceries make it clear that the bow was her preferred weapon, which is in line with the other female Albinoric archers. Her sickle says that it was originally given to her as a personal guard to the Karian family, but that the original embedded blue glintstone has been replaced with unalloyed gold. And of course we know that term unalloyed gold refers to Mikola's rule that he started when he saw that the golden order was not able to cure Melania's scarlet rot. Loretta left the Karian manor, she left the Karian royal family and goes to the Halleck tree and sees what Mikola is doing and she, she switches allegiances. The sarcastic language on her shield just echoes what would have been said about her at the time. I think it's very clear that she is absolutely an Albinoric and she was just hiding her identity so that she could find a place for her people to live in peace. So here is what I think may have happened here. I think that Ordinal Liturgical Town was built as an entrance to Mikola's Halleck Tree, which 
had become a beacon of hope for those who saw it as a sanctuary. We see Miss Begotten there praying to statues of Mikola. They're another group that was heavily abused and mistreated. But we don't find any Albanorics in the Halic Tree, despite them being all over the entrance of the town and how important it was to them and the fact that they have a medallion. So clearly they were intended to go there, but why aren't they there? And I think the clue is in the name of the apostate derelict. I think that the Albanorics became disenchanted with the Halic Tree. They, they realized it wasn't going to be a promised land intended for them and there still remained this longing for their own home, their own place that could be theirs. And after Mikola was stolen, the Halig tree stopped growing, so they might have just seen this as this unachievable dream that they've been working towards, but realizing that it was never going to come to pass. And this is why Latena's journey ends with her giving the sleeping Albanoric a birthing droplet to create life for the Albanorics. She could have just gone to live at the Halig tree in peace, but she knows that her real mission was to secure the future for her people. The connection to Mikola's Halig Tree now brings us to the last part of the story, which is at Mogwin's Palace. And this is where you find a huge number of those second generation Albanorics who are patrolling the area and blocking any intruders from proceeding. Well, some of them, some of them seemed just zonked out. <laughs> They're just staring off in the distance at something. And what is it that they appear to be staring at? They are looking at the mausoleum across the way that holds Mikola, who's become the savior figure to the unwanted. I personally think that might have been the reason that Mog, who is an omen, fell for him. I say fell for him, but <laughs> a toxic obsession with him or maybe saw Mikola as being worthy of stealing. But you'll see that a lot of the Albanorks here are red. And I think this is obviously a way to say that they've pledged allegiance to the Lord of Blood. They might have been promised a spot in the upcoming Mogwin dynasty and took this accursed blood upon themselves as a way to, to say, hey, yeah, I'm ready to serve you. And they've even got little horns growing on their heads and they have this move where these bloody spikes shoot out of their bodies. So I think them being here is just more evidence of how they really wanted a place they could belong to, and some of them found their way here. So that covers the history of the Albanorics. Now we can move on to my personal theories about how they were created. I told you that this is a really in-depth topic, but this next section won't be too long. So the Albanoric blood clots look a lot like silver tear husks, which come from the silver tears that are found in the Eternal City, which are these life forms that are stuck in this loop of being reborn again and again. They also have the same color blood as the Albanorics when you kill them. It's that pale white blood, that typical android blood. Mogwin's palace is also right next to Nakron in Shifer River, so that puts the Silver Tears and the Albanorics in right next to each other, right next door. This theme of silver again can also be seen with the Albanoric Archer's armor set, which says that the blue silver metal was born from the same mother as the archers themselves. And we see this silver in Loretta's shield, which is embedded with amber, and it's shaped as a sacred drop of dew. The Albanoric shield also has language about them being created from a primordial drop of dew, and we see dew again with celestial dew, which is called a hidden tear that's found in the Eternal City. And celestial dew will reverse all of your transgressions and the larval tears, which are the cores of silver tears, those are used to birth you anew, you basically respect with Renala. So we have this dewdrop, teardrop imagery and language which links all of this together by word association. There's also a recurring theme of arcane, both the silver tear mask and the albanoric mask will raise your arcane, and they're both silver in color, so more connections there. So what does all of this mean? I think this means that possibly the Albanorics, if first having came from primordial dew, from the Erdtree itself, are not without grace, but possibly one of the closest to it. But somewhere along the way, they were recreated and it went terribly wrong. And that's why the first generation Albanorics will all eventually lose movement in their legs. We know that the Nox used silver tears to create mimic tears, which were the result of their 
Dr. Frankenstein experiment to create an artificial lord, and this exacerbated them being banished underground by the greater will. But if the Nox could create people, then the Albanorx indeed could have been created as a race that was meant to be idealized or maybe created as servile followers or an army. Who knows? But the connection here is very strong for me, and I'm extremely confident that the Albanorx and the Silver Tears share the same origins. I also think that the birthing droplet that Latena gives the sleeping Albanoric giant might very well be a larval tear or some sort of variation of that and she's meant to be the Ronaldo of Albanorics who is going to hopefully birth them anew and create a better future for them. And that's it! I have officially shared everything I know about the Albanorics. This was an extremely long video to put together just because of how much stuff had to be connected but I had a lot of fun making it so I hope you enjoyed it too. If you have any insights on the Albanorix, I'd love to read them and as always I really appreciate the views and the comments and the subscriptions and all the support. It's just been, it's been so nice so I really appreciate it and I will see you next time. Bye!